So game-based learning, this is when we are able to learn by immersing ourselves in a gaming environment. Um, I remember distinctly when I was much younger, there was this amazing game we used to play called uh, The Incredible Machine. And I don't know if anyone else, let me just quicker, quickly run a poll, if anyone actually knows about The Incredible Sh Machine, if you've ever heard of it before. Um, but just a little quick thumbs up if you've ever heard of it. But The Incredible Sh Machine, what you actually ended up doing is you you ended up having having to solve these puzzles. These like really complicated puzzles. So I would have to, for example, somehow move this ball all the way down to, I imagine, into this fish tank. And then I would have all these, these different like little items and tools that I would have to move into place for all of this to happen. So there's like a little mouse over there that starts running when certain things happen. Um, and there's like a baboon that is going to get frightened when there's a cannon that's going to shoot and like all sorts of really complicated, elaborate things. But at the end of the day, as a small boy, I was having to solve really complicated problems through playing a game. And I have no doubt that I developed a lot of skills in the process of doing this. Um, maybe some, I mean, that's one example of a game. But I remember Civilizations. I don't know if anyone's heard of Civilizations before, but again, it's another game I played. And basically everything I know about history is based on playing this game and other games, other similar games, Civilizations, Age of Empires. There's a whole bunch of them that I used to play that taught me things about history. And I remember my colleague who taught at the same school as when I was still when I was still at school, he used to say the same thing. Like he was a history teacher and he based all of his history knowledge on playing games. And even more recently, one of the big ones that has made a lot of waves in terms of the gamification thing is Minecraft and some of the amazing things you can do with Minecraft. Now we had a series on Minecraft last year um, talking about what you can do with it. But today we want to bring you to a different game and, and something that's a little bit more quiz oriented that could be quite fun to kind of experience. But let's talk about the advantages of gamification. Why is gamification good? Um, what can you actually gain from gamification? Right. So to the elements of playing games for learning. So why is gamification good? Like, what are some of the cool things that we can get out of it? Um, so the, one of the first things that I think is is quite interesting is the minute that we add points to anything, then people kind of start paying attention a little bit more when 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 points are being scored. People love getting points, even though these points aren't translatable into anything other than, I suppose, bragging rights to a certain extent. And that leads into this idea of competition. Competition is a great thing. It's a terrible thing if it's unhealthy competition, but healthy competition is really worthwhile. And it's one of those things that we can leverage in our classrooms if we understand how to leverage in our classrooms. And then, of course, what, a critical part of this is the rules element. So why are rules important? Because rules tell us what the parameters are of any kind of thing that we're doing, how we need to score our points, how we need to go about winning the competition. So the competition, I think, is to a large extent the driving force because the rules will tell you how you can score your points and you want to score your points because there's a competition involved. Now, none of this at this point, are we even talking about learning? Are we talking about content? Are we talking about any of those things? We are just simply talking about this general idea of playing games. So how do we bring this back to actually the learning elements that are involved? Now, immediately when I do this, there is heightened engagement. Your engagement will immediately go up once you actually start adding this element of competition in. Yes, we have this competition that comes in and what we can do with GimKit is GimKit allows us to create that, to take that engagement 
into this competition. And the one thing we've been focusing on throughout this entire process of the formative assessment is the ability to close feedback loops and give instant feedback. When we add that competition element, because this is one of the things that's often a bit of an issue, we add different interesting um, digital tools to whatever it is that we're doing, but the kids aren't always engaging with these tools because they don't quite, I mean, they don't, they, they don't see the point of it. When we add this kind of competition element into it, when we add a fun element into it, they want to, which gives us feedback to a greater extent that we would get necessarily without it. Now, the cool thing about this feedback, as if you've joined us on any of the previous things, the feedback allows us to immediately start coming up with ideas of how we can how we can actually um, what we can do to engage our learners in a different way, what we can see when we get stuck with certain things, um, what we can do where we are getting stuck, where the learners aren't necessarily quite getting to what they what what we want them to to learn. Um, it closes that feedback loop for us. Right. So what we want to do now, and you have to give me a second, I just need to find a, a, a an example for us that we can do. Um, we are going to play a Gimkit game now, just so that you understand what it is. And then we're going to take that and we're going to start tying it into this gamification element. And I want to show you how we are able to how we're able to actually um, come up with 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 different. Um, sorry, how we can come up with with different kind of of types of gamification and really, really quickly and easily um, take that kind of gamification element that we are using and turn it into valuable feedback, right? Um, you'll see there's a, there's a number on your screen. Gimkit.com slash join, and then you're gonna enter that number. So I'm... Right, while they're joining the game, one of the, I think Craig mentioned this in the session that we did on Quizlet. Obviously, if you want to use something like Gimkit in your classroom, you will need to have learner devices. Learner devices can be an ancient, kind of not really 100% functional smartphone. That'll work. That'll do the trick. Um, I'm just going to give people a little bit more time to still join. That is going to do the trick for you. You will be able to do it on those devices. So it's something that I've often promoted in schools, and some people have followed it. And that is the idea of actually being trying to get old devices, making sure that there are some old devices that you're able to use. Now, I'll show you now as well. This is the screen that you are seeing. For those of you who are not able to join the session, let me show you quickly what it looks like for a learner. So for a learner, they'll get this question, what is your name? So I'm going to enter my name. My name is Yaku. I'll join the session. And the way the game works is we have, we get this question. So this is not a new concept. Anyone who's used formative assessment tools before, this is kind of the same as many other formative assessment tools work, which is the largest mammal in the world. That is the blue whale. So I get $1. What I like about this, what's a little bit different in, Gim in, in GimKit, is I go on to streaks, which is the largest country in the world, right? So what's the largest country? Hmm, I'm going to say Russia. So now you'll see I've got on a streak. I've got two. So that means immediately, remember when we spoke about the rules of the game, there's an incentive to get things right. Not only do I get money, but I can't just guess things because when I guess things, I get it wrong. Who was the first person to walk on the moon, right? So I'm going to say Amelia Earhart. Now I lose money, right? And it tells me what the correct answer should be. So instant feedback from the learner side. Question, answer. I know if I'm right, I know if I'm wrong, but 
what's different to for me in some things is there's actually more incentive to get things right. So let's get try to go into another uh, street quickly. Which country made reggae initially? Jamaica. So they've got Jamaica. I'm going to continue. What is the tallest mountain in Japan? That is Mount Fuji. So now when I get to this point, and this is where the game gets really interesting once you've played it with your learners enough, is when we look at this shop option, right? So over here, I can see there's a shop and not just continue. So if I click on shop, it gives me the option over here, you can see I can buy upgrades. I can buy, buy power-ups. Um, the themes part, i be honest, I haven't really invested too much time in that, but these things are cool. So when I get my upgrades, that means I can now start saying, I've got $505 in the bank over here, and yet, unfortunately, you can't change dollars to rands. This is a question that people often ask. I can go to money per question, and I can say, but I'm going to buy this level three money per question. So now I'm getting $50 per question that I get right. So let's buy that. Now I go back to my questions. Longest river in the world, the Nile. Now I'm not just getting one, two, three, four, five dollars. I'm getting 50, which is the capital of Argentina. Venice is 51. So I start at 50. And the cool thing is if I get something wrong, what is the largest organ in the human body? The heart. Right. I lose 50 as well. So again, incentive not to get things wrong, but to try and get things right. Who is the Prime Minister of Canada? The Prime Minister of Canada is Trudeau, again 50. So I start at 50 and I'm and I drop at 50. But one of the other cool things you can do, and let's just check if I've still got time for this because I only give myself five, five minutes. Oh, I've got 42 seconds, right. So you'll see over here, Louis has gone into the lead because Louis knows how to do all these things. Hagen has played this game before as well. He knows how to do a lot of these things. They've all gone for upgrades. What I can do as well, I'm just going to show you this very quickly. If I go into the shop, there are also power-ups. So I can use this ISA as, a, as an example. I'm going to activate the ISA on Louis. Oh, wait, that's not where I want to go. Once you use my ISA on Louis, and that would freeze Louis for a bit, for a, a short while. So the last four seconds, he was not able to do anything. Right. And there we go. Start with Fantastic. first upping the whole money per question thing. And then I saw, OK, cool, this is now nicely building. Then I started upping my my streak bonus. So now I'm getting a double bonus for, for not only money per question, but it gets multiplied. So there's a multiplier that gets into effect. But I only started going for the streak bonus once I was sure I'd memorized all the questions and answers. So now I was getting like four, five hundred, seven thousand dollars every question in the last 10 seconds. It, it really adds up if you combine the different types of bonuses and your kids are going to really figure that out. And it's fun. I wish I had, you know, started freezing people earlier. That would have been cool too. Right. So I love what Louis pointed out here because if you're listening carefully, what he's actually talking about, he's talking about learning a whole bunch of other things inside of us answering multiple choice questions on general knowledge. He's talking about having to make decisions on where do I spend my money on getting power ups and improving things. He also spoke about the idea of making sure he's memorized all the answers because he doesn't want to get it wrong. It means he loses things. So there's an actual incentive in terms of the way we play this game to try and get these things right. And the mechanics of the game, just so you understand that, you set up your quiz with how, however many questions you want to set it up with. And then from there on, when you've set up your quiz with how many ever questions you want, the game will go on for the for how long you specified it to go on. It won't. Um, so in other words, it won't stop if you're done with your 10 questions. It'll continue looping it. It's not a good idea to only have 10 questions and have those 10 questions repeat 500 times, except if you really, really, really want to drill it into your learners' heads. So, I mean, there's different ways we can use it. But immediately you can see the kind of engagement that we can get from this. So here I've got this kind of um, screen on this end that shows me how people did. So all the way at the bottom, 
I see um, Zaliswa is there at the bottom, Edwina, and I'm sure Zaliswa basically got there because she probably just bought, bought some upgrades just before we ended the game. So again, important to keep your eye on things like that. I mean, we're just learning how this thing works. But you can understand why it's important for kids to get used to this. This is another thing that we speak about often is familiarity with tools as opposed to just getting the wow factor in your classroom. And on my learner side, here I can, can see I answered seven questions correctly. I got two of those questions wrong and I can see the, the ranking. I ended 28th, which is, isn't great. I think next time I'll try a little bit harder. Gives me a sense of do I know what's happening in the content or not. Okay, so from this from this screen, now we don't want to play this again. We're going to go to Gimkit itself and show you how we set these things up. Right. So how do we actually go and create a new kit? So once you get to Gimkit, you're going to have to register yourself. Um, I'm not going to go through that whole process. It is pretty straightforward. Um, you can just log in with your with any of your typical accounts. Um, so I'm going to share my opinion on this because there's there's no right or wrong answer. I think every digital tool that we use has its uses and has its function um, in 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 the learning process. For me. Um, and I'll be honest, I haven't looked at all the new features of Kahoot. I, I played Kahoot with my learners quite a lot. What I found happened with Kahoot, unfortunately, is um, the minute that learners start falling behind, they start losing interest. And what I also found with Kahoot, because Kahoot rewards speed and not accuracy, it becomes very frantic. And it's not always... It's not always the, the 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 content I feel gets lost in the the fun, if I can put it like that. So that engagement level is 100% there because they enjoy Kahoot. They kids really enjoy Kahoot, and it's not difficult to it's 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 easy to set up. But I do feel sometimes that um, with Kahoot, or I felt in my classrooms often, it it. It, it you lose a lot of the learners along the way because it's a frantic scramble to get things done quickly. With Gimkit, the the nice thing about Gimkit is the focus is on accuracy. The focus is on getting things right. You, there's 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 a there's a you are incentivized not to just guess answers because guessing answers really does derail you if you're trying to build momentum. In this instance, you saw Louis was able to rush to a lot of money because I allowed you to start with a lot of money. And I'll show you how that works as well. If you don't, if you if you let learners start with zero, they first need to be careful at getting their answers correct. If they want to get to a point where they can start investing, where they can start getting money quicker. The other thing that's cool is, um, if I were to actively play this against Louis, and Louis knows this, then both of us would basically just be buying a whole bunch of things to block each other and probably end last, both of us. That's likely what we'll do. But we'll have fun doing it, and we'll have another focus, and that focus is make sure you get as many questions right so that you can get the, the money you need to stop your friend. Ultimately, it comes back to that same thing. There's a focus on on accuracy and correctness, which I feel is not always there for Kahoot. That being said, where I've seen Kahoot being used, and I know I'm talking a lot and not showing much now, but just kind of sharing my views on this. Um, with that being said, Kahoot, I feel, is an incredibly nice tool to 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 kind of get to get a sense of baseline knowledge. So in other words, if you haven't taught the content yet, if you don't know what your learners know about the content yet, and accuracy isn't such an important thing. For you, it's more a case of you want to get a quick sense of, do they know what you're talking about? Um, I think Kahoot is, is an amazing tool in that sense because it is engaging, because it is exciting, etc. So it does allow for that. The other thing that Kahoot does well, that Gimkit doesn't do, is Kahoot because it is teacher-paced, 
Kahoot allows you to ask a question, test knowledge, and then talk about that question. GimKit doesn't do that. GimKit is, is more of a, so in a process, I would call Kahoot is a great baseline tester. GimKit is a nice kind of way to test something to test content once it's already been taught once you want to determine did they actually understand what you have taught them already um let's have a look at a new kit so if i want to create a new kit this is these things are all very similar in the way they go they call their games kits um and not necessarily games so we're going to go to create a new kit let's get there and we just want to call our kit. Um, what are we? I'm just going to use examples that I always use Romeo and Juliet, or should I use a different one? Okay, so our subject is um, da, 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 where is this now? English, language, arts. Of these subjects are not based on the, on the um, unfortunately, the, 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 the sub, these subjects is not based on the South African context, so we'll have to deal with what there is there. Then they ask you for a cover photo. It really doesn't matter what you use here. You can use it. If you find a cool image that you want to use online, you can go and, find, and get the hyperlink for that. When we get to this point, Right, when we get to this point, you'll see there's there are different options for adding questions. You've got the add question over there. You've got create with flashcards, kit collab, which is really cool. I'll show you that at the end. And then question bank, import from spreadsheet. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you could do this. I'm just gonna show you the most basic way now, and that is adding a question, right? So let's say add question. We want to have a who wrote the play Macbeth. Now you can choose the over here. You'll see you can choose which one is the correct answer. It can have multiple correct answers. It's a very clean, straightforward interface, right? When it comes to text input, I generally don't recommend text input for the most part for these things because immediately you have that issue of typing accuracy, spelling accuracy. So I don't usually recommend text input. However, you're more than welcome to fiddle around with it and see what it does. I haven't used it in the past. Then you'll see there are other options here like add photo. So I can again go to a link go to unsplash, go to upload if I want. Okay, I can't do upload. So just one thing about GimKit, and I've known about GimKit for a while, but GimKit's free version used to have almost no features. They've opened it up quite a lot now. So it's, it is 100% usable in a classroom environment without you having to spend any money on it. Um, it's got some very cool features if you do go for the pro version. But you're going to have to scratch around and see what is available on Pro and what isn't. And they kind of fiddle with these parameters from time to time as well. So not everything that is going to be spoken about in this video, if you watch it, if you're watching it now somewhere down the line, will necessarily all still be available. And some of what is not available now might become available. They fiddle with this all the time. Last time I checked, they actually allowed this upload, but it seems it's not no longer allowed. But as long as we can use a link, I can still go and insert my link, the same one I did there. So there is my image that is going to display with my question. Should I want to do that? The audio I know is a pro thing. So in other words, if you get the pro version, that means you could actually ask a question by recording your audio, and then they'll have to answer that based on the question that you asked. So it does add some cool things. We're just going to use this as a multiple choice question. Okay. So now I've got my first question. Who wrote the play Macbeth? If I don't want to do all of these on my own, there's an ad from a question bank. So now I can search for Macbeth and you'll see very similar to what we could do in quizzes. I don't know if some of you might have attended that session that we did on quizzes. I can do the same thing here. So I can have this. Um, 
kind of true false. I don't really like this option where I've got four options: true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. Um, yes, I think it could work well for. Well, I think it could work for a number of things. But yeah, it's cool. I've got 69 questions done and dusted, ready and good to go. I don't even have to think about this. So I can just say add all questions. Or if I want to, I can say one by one. I like that one. I like that one. I like that one. I like like that one. Don't like that one. I like that one. And then I just hover over the next one. Yeah, Macbeth set up by a student, it seems. The student sets up good ones. I like it. I don't like this question mark one. But let's say add all questions. And just like that, I actually have my kit ready. I've got a whole bunch of questions ready to ask. How quick and easy was that? And the question people ask about, can I do this for other languages? Yes, you write whatever you want to write. So if you write an Afrikaans question and you write an Afrikaans answer, it'll be Afrikaans. If you write an Isikosa question and Isikosa answers, you know what happens. Uh, when it comes to the question bank, again, you are going to probably find there's not a lot of Afrikaans on this. Um, there will, okay, here we go. There's some Afrikaans in Viskunde. Tutsi Afrikaans, Afrikaans, Groot 5 tot 7. So, hey, there's stuff at Linden did. Look at that. There's, there's, this is a perfect example of a question that Lyndon has now added to this. He's contributed to this greater community of questions that we can get on GIMKit. So now we have access to the questions that he's put up. This was the one that, well, created six hours ago. I imagine this is a, one that you used in your classroom recently, Lyndon. So um, great examples of what we can find and what we can get from this. Right, so. Right, so Lyndon has pointed out the mechanisms of GIMKit is easier to set up quick quizzes, especially when you already have spreadsheets with questions and answers. Yes, I'm going to show you how cool that is. Um, yes, I like I like the, the the examples that people are coming up with here. That ChatGPT is great for generating questions as well. I'm going to show you. We're going to test it. I actually haven't tested it yet, but we'll test it live in this session. What exactly we can do with that? Okay, so now my thing is done. Perfect. I'm happy. I'm going to say all done. All right. Now, when it comes to my kits, here's a bunch of kits that I have. I have options over here. Play live or assign as homework. So if I click on the options there, it gives me the options, of course, to go and check out the reports. Um, so, yeah, I can go and have a look at the reports of the different ones that I did. So, for example, the one that I... The general knowledge one I use now, um, because I just use the random one that I found that I found quickly by searching for one, it doesn't show me the report of that one. However, if I've created this one, even if I didn't create it, I just pulled it from different sources, then when I play these things, I get a report. And that report gives me a breakdown of a whole bunch of things. So let's say, for example, I look at this report of one that we played recently. So here it actually shows me the questions that were asked. Let me just zoom out a little bit here. So question breakdown, student overview, quick stats. So all kinds of things. And in, on the individuals who were part of this, this is just an, a, a, an example of a GIM kit we used on Saturday um, that we used for meeting our colleagues. And this will give you that, that 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 kind of report that I was talking about, understanding where your learners are, question breakdown, understanding the questions and which questions you struggled with. Right, I'm getting to that Teams thing now. You guys keep on preempting where I'm going with this thing. I love it. It's great. Okay, so it's good that we are asking these questions because it means that we are interested in what we can do with this thing. Right, now the one thing that I find very unfortunate still is this assign homework part is also part of the pro edition. And that is, I think, the potentially most interesting use of this tool. Because if you can do the assign homework, what it means is a learner will get a link that they need to log in with. We'll talk about the classes in a second. They need to log in with that link. They get the 
10 minutes and they need to see how many points they can score in that 10 minutes based on this thing. That becomes their homework. Imagine sending your kids home to play a game and to see how much they can learn through playing a game. That to me is an incredible, incredible opportunity with this that we can't use on the free version, unfortunately. So what we can do is the play live version. Now, that question on the, can we play it at, as teams or as individuals? You'll see here, we've got the classic mode and we have the teams mode. So we play the classic mode. I'm just going to show you the setup of the classic mode quickly. If I use the, the classic mode, then in terms of the parameters that I have, over here I can set the minutes, the time. I could assign a class. We'll talk about the class in a second. Um, I've got my starting cache that I can decide how much I want. We can add the music. We can add clapping. We can use clean up power, clean power ups only. That's really boring. I love the the way that you can stop people. Nickname generator. If we don't want learners to have to type in their names and join late, so you're kind of normal things that you can set with these things. And here's something that does make it a little bit unique: the time, the race, and the all in options. So I kind of like this because race says this is now a race who gets to a certain goal first. And the all in option is based on everyone is collectively building towards that. So here's a cool way again of adding that com competition element to it. If you if you're teaching across multiple classes, you can give them all the same thing. You can play the all in and you can tell the classes. The other guys reach the five million dollars mark in 10 minutes. Let's see if you guys can beat them. So again, there's there's a kind of a different element to this that I like that they bring in that competition element without it necessarily having to be like a really frantic, crazed thing. I, I like that 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 kind of thinking man's competition in a way. What you can also do with a play live is you can go and you can use the teams mode of this, right? So now we're going into the teams mode. We select players per team, and it's a bit of a different kind of experience than the individual one because now there are four of them that are collectively working towards things, answers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I wouldn't recommend when you start off with this that you do the teams version to start with. I think it is best that you do the individual one first so that your kids kind of learn about the game mechanics. No one started playing a game and was good at it, good at it from day one, especially if it adds a few complicated complications to it. Um, so let them first learn the game mechanics before you try the teams mode. Right. So we're going to use grade 12 geography um, and we will use, I don't know if there's a geography over here. Uh, it doesn't matter. Let's just call it science. All right. So now we are going to look for geography over here. Of course, we're going to use ChatGPT. What else would I do? Right. So now when we want to do this, I want to show you what we could potentially do when we want to integrate AI into this thing, not using um, the Gimkit AI. So here we open up ChatGPT. I just want this. Um, Right, so generate 10 multiple choice questions on geography for grade 12 South African learners. Right. So now it's generating my multiple choice questions for me in ChatGPT. How quick and easy was that? With all the answers. Easy as that. So what I could be doing now, if I wanted to set this up, is there I've got my question. I'm going to copy my question. I go to, I really need to close this thing. It reminds me how poorly I did. Right, so I can go add question. I ask my question. Let's see how clever ChatGPT or this thing is. Let's see if we can copy all four answers and go and paste. No, it doesn't. So now I need to paste them one by one. Pretty cool. However, 
and I can't guarantee this is going to work. Let's try something else. So chat, so in GimKit, I also have this option. Import spreadsheet. Right, so we've got this import spreadsheet that gives me the option of specify just the question and the correct answer or specify the question, correct answer and incorrect answers. So I could potentially have this template. Now bear with me what I can do with this because this becomes a little bit more complicated, but this is our summit level session. So I think we can show off a little bit what we could do. So there I've got my template theoretically. Over here on ChatGPT, I've got my, my questions. So let's see if I can say, rewrite this into a into a table with five columns column one is the question column two the correct answer and columns three to five the incorrect answers right let's go down there we go Now, as it is rewriting this thing into table format, I want to show you how cool this next pro step is. So now I can go and I can literally go and select all of that. Go copy, control C. Go into GimKit, control V. There I've got it pasted in that formula, in that format that it wants me to have it. I can download this as a CSV file. And then over here with it, I'm now going to just upload my GimKit CSV file. And if it all worked, there we go. All my questions imported into ChatGPT, from ChatGPT into GimKit, ready to go. This is the point where it would have been cool to see people because I think that is a yeah. that is a really, really crazy way of using it. Translate this into Afrikaans because I want to set up an Afrikaans one. So there's my Afrikaans one being set up. Or I can also say if I need that in another language, translate this into now I'm really going to push it because I don't know if this is going to work. Well, there we go. Now it's translating it into, into Corsa. So just to give you a sense of what you could potentially do with all of this, um, with this whole with this whole system, um, if we were to just go into a new chat quickly, I can do the same thing for basically anything. So. Here I've got my geography question questionnaire ready to go. We're going to say all done. You saw how quick and easy that was to create using artificial intelligence. Now let's go into another kind of crazy, cool, exciting um, way of playing this game. So I'm going to go to play live now. What you'll see, what GimKit also does is it has a whole bunch of different modes in which you can play it. So yeah, you'll see 2D modes that you have, all of those different options. Then you can see you've got farm chain, you've got tag domination, snowy survival, capture the flag, one way out, snowball, trust no one, the floor is lava, humans versus zombies, a whole bunch of things. However, if you don't notice it, it's got a little star next to it, which means it's part of the paid for version and not the free version. However, the one thing that is always available on the free version is the Fishtopia game. So Fishtopia is always available. And this one that you see over here that says trust no one is constantly rotating, right? So it will, at the moment it is trust no one, but in I'm not sure how many how many weeks it um, it rotates if it's once a month or once every two weeks or something like that. 
But once in a while, that second mode changes to something else to keep you kind of engaged and intrigued in how it works. There's only one way to understand and experience Fishtopia, and that is to actually play Fishtopia. So we're going to play Fishtopia now again, or we'll play another game. I've used the general knowledge one, um, just so that people have an understanding. We're going to play this for, hmm, let's make it 10 minutes, um, and let's make it four bait per question so we can get things moving quickly, or let's make it a lot. Let's make it five bait per question. Right. So you'll see how this works now. I'm going to go, I'm going to start my game mode. Right. I'll give you the link as soon as it shows. Now, again, what I want you to think about when you're playing this is how would you apply this so I'm going to copy the link and just put it in, in the chat. How would I take something like this and apply it to my subject, to my content, to all of those things, for example? Right. Thank you, Louis. You pointed out a number of limitations for us. So 2D modes limited to 60 learners on free mode, I think. Multiple choice ones of 500 player limit on free. Right. So you won't hit the 500 limit, but you won't hit 60 learners either. Hopefully. It works. Right. Yes, as we said, informal assessment, make them love Friday. So I'm going to stay quiet for a few and then just give you the opportunity to kind of explore and see what is happening. See if you can figure it out. And then I'll explain it to you. So what I can say is Beerman, Fazila, Insof, they're at the right place. We need to get to the questions. Jovanko, you can't go fishing if you don't have bait. So what I need to do is I need to fish to get money. So this is all revolving around the same basic principle. It's a competition who can get the most things right. So here we see there is the answering station. Right, Lance, I hope you're going to get in soon. So there's the answering station. I need to answer questions. Once I've answered those questions, I get bait for every question. Right? So no, go away, Carla. We don't want to click on you now. Right, so I get bait for those questions. That I then take to this pond over here to go fish with. Once I've managed to catch enough, then I need to take the fish that I have and I need to go sell it over here. So let me get give you a sense of how it works. I go to question one. What type of animal is Bambi? Bambi is a deer. I get five bait. Which country has the most people? China. Right. Who wrote the Harry Potter series? Now, one thing I want to point out here, the questions that you see, I mean, the answers are incredibly obvious here. And this is one of the reasons why I don't like the import mode where you only have question and answer because what it'll do is it'll draw on the other answers as examples of wrong answers and i don't think that to me ultimately doesn't really work it is much better if you are adding questions with a question a correct answer and three answers that might be right if you don't know what is happening right so jk rowling i'll close this now you'll notice over here it tells me I have 15 bait, right? I've got 15 bait. I can now go catch fish. So I'm going to stand over here next to the pond. I'm going to hit enter and it's going to try and find fish. Right. I found a gray fish. I'll find another fish. So now you see I've used 10 bait. I'll go to the cell station. I'm going to go sell all my fish. Right, so now I've got 18 cash. 
Let's see if I can do anything with 18 cash. There's a gear shop up here. Let's go to the gear shop. So here at the gear shop, you'll see I can buy all sorts of things, right? I can buy a, a small backpack, medium backpack, a large backpack. There's fishing gear. The fishing vetter rod is, allows me to catch things quicker. I can go to the power-up shop and Lucky Lane. So let's go to that. Right, so here's a power-up. If I have 30, I can move faster. I can fish instantly and I can actually earn more cash. So again, same as when we played the other game, I reinvest what the money that I make to get more things. So let's try and get a little bit more cash quickly. I've got, let's see quickly if I can get to, get on the boat yet. Where are the tickets? Oh, these tickets. Oh, I'm going to go get the purple pond ticket. Right. So the purple pond ticket, now I'm buying, I've spent $10 to buy a purple pond ticket. That means I can now go to the purple pond where I get to fish with Ami at the purple pond. Yeah, I'm theoretically supposed to find better fish. So far, so good. All right, now my backpack is full again. So the thing that's cool about this is ultimately what happens regardless of what you're doing every single time you're going to have to get back to answer questions to get bait. Now I've set my thing to give you seven, to get give you five bait every single time you answer a question correctly, which means that we are able to kind of get bait very, very quickly um, and we're able to make money very, very quickly. That's again different from other modes is you kind of after a while you get into your own space. You're not really paying attention to what everyone else is doing. You you are more focused on on doing your thing, which means that you there's that competition element is there without you necessarily actively, you know, competing. So Beerman won well done, Beerman. You've got 134. Ami's got 90. Let's quickly, whoever is Beerman, do you want to raise your hand quickly? So the, the upgraded fishing rod and the upgraded backpack, and then I went to the first purple pond, but it sucked. So I spent the $85 on the on the sandy beach, and I only managed to visit it, visit it once, but I'd make like $100 each time. I had $200 worth of fish in my backpack, and I was like five seconds away of selling it. So it's really worth it to go for that second pawn for the eighty dollar ticket. Anyway, yeah, that right. was my strategy. But the the cool thing is we weren't actively aware necessarily of what the other people were doing, and you get kind of absorbed into your own thing. Now imagine for a second you're able to assign this as homework for a learner, that for ten minutes they're running around, they're playing games on their phone, and they're answering questions on the work that you are teaching them. And you, at the end of the day, when I say view report, because I'm the teacher, I can get feedback 
on the answers, I still get that same kind of feedback that I was go that I got the other way around. I can still see a question breakdown. How accurate were they in answering these questions? It shows me where's the Earth's most active volcano. People got that one wrong. So this is something that I know in my class I need to look at. I need to revise. I get my student overview and I can see over here, Ami only got the one question wrong. Louis only answered 19 questions and he ended up top. He didn't get anything wrong. But as I go down, I can see where people got things wrong and I can go individually and I can click on Ami, who I'm sure won't mind. And I can see the one question she got wrong was the volcano question. So I get that level of feedback as well. But at the same time, I'm actually not. It, 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 kids don't even realize that they're learning as they're going along and they don't realize that there is an active incentive for them getting these questions right. So I think that's a very exciting to me. That's a very exciting potential use of this whole system and this whole tool. But incredible potential for technology to play to play a, a completely transformative role in this process. And it's the concept of assessment as learning. So when we talk about assessment of learning, we're talking about our summative assessments, our formal tests. We test whether or not learners have learned. Assessment for learning, which is what this whole series has been about, is has the focus of looking at how we can use assessment, how we can use this formative assessment to feed back into our teaching practice so that we've got that feedback loop that we are changing the way that we are actually, that we can adjust the just-in-time teaching concept, that we adjust what we're teaching. The third, and I think it's an emerging and very exciting concept, is the assessment as learning, where we are asking learners to create assessments. And through the process of creating that assessment, they are in fact learning. So I'm going to, let's try and see how this goes um, because we've got a nice big group in. I hope we have a few people contributing. We're going to call this one general knowledge. We're just going to say we take this books thing, feels like something. Now we're going to use this tool within Quizlet called Kit Colab. Now, what Kit Colab does. You'll see there, it allows anybody to contribute questions to the kit. So we are actually building a kit together. Right, so I'm going to say enable kit collab. I'm going to take this link. And I'm going to copy and paste it into the chat. Right, it says Jakob van Ekerk has invited you to contribute questions to their general knowledge kit. Once you enter, you can submit questions to be added to the kit. Right, so I'm going to contribute a new question. I want to ask a random multiple choice question. So what question could we ask? Yeah, I've added, I'm going to add this question. Now I want to show you what happens. It tells me that it's waiting for approval. So I could add more. Thanks, Louis. We know that you Google that right now. So. Here we could add more questions if we wanted to, but what it shows up on the teacher's side, you can see is I can go and say, which popular video game features a battle royale mode where 100 players compete, right? So I'm gonna add this to the kit. How many provinces are there in South Africa? In South, said so that, I'm gonna add that to the kit. Ami said, in what year did Bruce Springsteen visit South Africa? I'm going to add that to the kit. It's just taking a little bit longer to load you. In Sof, it doesn't seem to want to add your question. I'm going to add Gato's question. How many? And then this last question, because Yaku is being silly with his answers, I will reject it. I'm not sure why that one's taking so long. Right? What capital is the... Okay, there it goes. No wall. So... The nice thing about this, and there are other ways to go about this, but what they've literally done for us is they've created a platform where you can have your learners as part of their 
assessment. I love what Louis mentioned, do this on like a Friday to check whether or not knowledge has been retained during the week or like as a last kind of push before a test, etc. But you can have this, your period split into two parts. One part where they're actually going through their work and setting up their own multiple choice questions. Because what you have to understand in the process of setting up a question, right? So yeah, it was rejected. So now I could edit it if mean teacher Yaku will actually take it this time and now he does accept it. So what you have to understand in the process of contributing a question. So let's say, for example, I'm going to ask um, who is the real villain in. Oh, I can't even spell villain anymore in Romeo or let's say in Macbeth. OK, so in that process, when a learner is setting up a question like that and they need to come up with the answer and three possible wrong answers, remember what is actually happening is they are kind of going through the potential answers in their head, which consolidates the information even more. They're doing that and they're thinking about right answers and wrong answers, and they don't want to set easy questions because ultimately when all of this is done, we're going to set this kit for a whole group to play. And if my questions are too easy, my friends will get all of them right easily. I want to make sure my questions challenge them and they will do the same thing. So I'll actually end up having a nice challenging set of questions that learners can use. Obviously, the first time round that you use this thing, there will be bumps and bruises along the way. Um, but the more you do it, the more familiar learners become with it, the more part of the process it becomes. So. Right, we're going to add this. Who won the rugby game last night? So here we go. Now I've got this whole thing done, and I say all done, and I'm actually done with my with my kit. So I showed you these different ones just to show you quickly what we have over here. The first one that we set up was one that we were importing questions from the questions that are already set up in GimKit, and I created my own questions. That was pretty quick and easy. The second one was the one that we used AI to generate for us, which again, that was pretty quick and easy. The third one that we created over here, the general knowledge one, this is the one that we actually were creating together. We were all adding our questions to this last general knowledge one. And I think the other part that I love is the different modes in which you can play this thing. So that I think covers everything that I wanted to cover in the session GimKit. Maybe we'll do uh, all in. Let's see how much money we can make in 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 five minutes, all of us collectively. Over there, I'm going to say in game. I apologize profusely to those of you who still playing the game. Um, and again, thank you for attending the session. Next time when you're playing the game, I hope you're doing it with the learners in your classroom.